When I planned this lecture a year ago, I had no idea how topical it would be. I can assure you it is pure coincidence, but it's a very interesting and nice coincidence that today I'm going to talk about mathematics and voting. And I'm sure you will agree with me that we all live in interesting times. I don't know more times more interesting than today. So voting is important, of course, for the general election. It is, of course, important for Brexit. And most importantly of all, it comes into Strictly Come Dancing. I will touch on all three in this lecture, plus other areas as well. So all these have the commonality that they depend in some way upon voting. And what is voting? Well, broadly speaking, voting is taking a group who have opinions and turning their opinions into a decision in such a way that this is a fair way, it's representative of what the group collectively believes in, and importantly, is anonymous. So that's what voting is all about. And in this lecture, I'm going to tell you of various types of voting strategy and ways that voting is done. We will explore various political things. And finally, we're going to have a look at that really important subject, the Eurovision Song Contest. OK. So voting is a branch of mathematics. The study of voting is a branch of mathematics. And the great man of the field was Kenneth Arrow. Here we are who won the 1972 Nobel Prize in economics for his work to try to get a rigorous mathematical view on what voting was all about. Now, the way mathematics works is that we write down axioms. These are things that we think must be true. And then we try to deduce the properties of what those axioms describe. So we have the axioms of arithmetic, and the axioms of logic, and the axioms of geometry. And what Arrow did was write down what he thought were good axioms for voting. So here I, um, this is what he was uh, always thinking about, an election where you have many candidates, there we are, and the voters have preferences on those candidates. So let's have a look at Arrow's axioms. Here we are. He had four axioms. Number one was what he called the dictator axiom, which is that if you have several people voting, the vote should reflect the opinions of all of them and not just one. Okay, so there should not be a dictator. And that's reasonable. Number two was the unanimity axiom, that if everyone prefers candidate A to candidate B, then A should win ahead of B. Again, perfectly reasonable. Thirdly, universality. You want your voting system to produce a result. Otherwise, what's the point? Well, we'll come back to that later. OK, I think you're all thinking what I'm thinking. And finally, uh, and this is kind of subtle but reasonable, which is that if candidate A is preferred to candidate B by the voters, then the, uh, any third candidate should not affect whether A comes ahead of B. And he called this the independence of irrelevant alternatives. And I shall call it, more quickly, no tactical voting. So by changing to C, you don't change A over B. So those are Arrow's four axioms. And since that, people have thought a bit more and have come up with a few more reasonable axioms. So here are for a few more. The majority condition. So if a candidate is the top choice for a majority of the voters, then really, really reasonably, that candidate should get elected. That's the majority condition. Monotonicity means that if I want candidate A to win, I shouldn't change their chance of winning by putting them top of my ballot. OK, I shouldn't, by putting them bottom, allow them to win. That doesn't make sense. In a democracy, 
Anonymity is very important, so the voting process should not uniquely identify who voted. And last but not least, practicality. There are some voting systems out there which are brilliant. They're theoretically fantastic. The only problem is that if you have a reasonable electorate, say 10,000 people, it would take months to work out who's actually won. So we need a system which is practical. In mathematical speak, this is polynomial in time. And there are some reasons why you want, um, for things like Strictly Come Dancing or Eurovision or TV voting, where it has to be real time. The decision has to be made instantly. So these are four more axioms. So there we have Arrow's original axioms, plus a few more, and there's other axioms that people have laid down. So that's the good news. We can write down axioms for voting. We can say this is what should be, and everyone could agree in the room that is good. OK, I could ask for a vote, but that would seem silly, really. <laughs> OK, but there's one small problem, and this is what Arrow found out. The problem is there's no voting system which can satisfy all the axioms. There's no one voting system which can satisfy for the four um, uh, axioms that Arrow himself laid down. In other words, if you take what everyone seems to be reasonable, you can prove there's no system which satisfies them all. And this was a bit of a worry at the time. It could mean the death of democracy, that we can never have a dem democratic voting system which does what we think it should do. But really, it's more a comment on our human nature. We're just asking too much of something. And what this is really saying is that all voting systems are a compromise. Some systems have flaws, or well, all systems have flaws, and you adjust the flaws to be what you think is best for the circumstances that you are dealing with. And that's why it's such an interesting subject, voting. You can't mathematize it completely. All you can do is find systems which are good. And I, what I'm going to do today is take you through some good systems, take you through some bad systems, and then, then we're going to see how they apply in a few practical circumstances. But I thought we'd start off by looking at a, a voting method which is quite widely used. We use it a lot in my university and show you the strengths and weaknesses of, the, of this, which will allow you to sort of see how Arrow's axioms work in this particular case. And then we're going to have a look at more general types of voting system. So the one I'm going to tell you about is the border voting method. And this was invented or discovered uh, probably about 500 years ago. It's been rediscovered since and pre-discovered as well. So the border voting system is something we would generally use in my university if we are interviewing for a job and we have an interview panel and we want to come to a collective decision from that interview panel as to who should get the job. And the idea is very simple. You have N, capital N, candidates. And each of the uh, voters can rank order the candidates, putting uh, the top one first and bottom one last. And they, in that rank order, give them a weighting. So they give them a weighting of N minus 1 to the top candidate and 0 to the bottom candidate. And you can be really quite flexible. You can say you can give as many candidates as you like, 0, if you like none of them. And then you just add them up, and the candidate with the largest number of votes wins. And that is called the border method. Anyone that watches Strictly Come Dancing, again, I won't take a poll. I do. Um, only for the voting, of course. Um, uses a slightly similar process where each judge gives each dance pair a mark from 10 to 1, and then you add up the marks at the end, and the pair with the highest marks wins the judges' part of the competition, and then you combine that with a viewer, um, um, an audience ranking as well. So this is the border method. Very popular, very easy to use. There's only one country in the world which uses it for elections, and that's Slovenia. And we'll see why it's not perfect in a minute. But it's perfectly reasonable kind of voting. So let's see how it actually works. 
Um, I'm going to be using tables quite a lot, so I'll try and explain my tables so that you can understand how we are going to do things. Um, along the top of, of each table is going to be candidates in an election. So here's an election with three candidates, A, B, and C. And on the side, we have three voters, V1, V2, and V3. And in this election, the voters have expressed their preferences for each candidate with a number. So there are three candidates. The top score is two. So voter one and voter two have given A two votes. And uh, voter three has given A one vote. So A gets a total of five. B gets one. C gets three. And so in this election, it's pretty clear that A has won. Also, A has come top choice for two of the voters, so they have won the majority of the votes as well. So there's a clear winner in this case. The winner is A. Here's our second example. Uh, a has come the top choice of voter one and voter three, but voter two really didn't like them very much. Voter B is a little bit more of a compromise, and A and B have ended up with four votes, and C has won one vote. So the result of that is a tie. Now, what we do in Bath, if we were electing a lecturer at this stage, we'd, we'd say, well, we just eliminate C. No one wants that. Now go back and we'll do the vote again and see if we come to a, a decision. And that's easy enough to do in that case because everyone's there to do it. So that's all very well and good. Um, but does the border method actually satisfies Arrow's axioms. What the border method basically does is elect a candidate which is broadly supported by all of the voters. So it's a kind of a consensus system. It tends not to elect radical people because you've got to get a broad consensus. However, we're going to see an example in a minute where it can be dictated to by one voter where one voter can actually completely swing the vote and all the other voters get ignored. So it actually doesn't satisfy dictator. The unanimity and monotonicity candidate occur axioms are satisfied. If you consistently rank A above B, then A will always get more marks than B, and therefore, if you add up the marks, the marks for A will total to a bigger total than B. Mathematically, if X is greater than Y, Y is greater, W is greater than Z, then the sum is greater. So that's great. The border method has the mon monotonicity condition. Does it satisfy universality? No, it doesn't. We've already seen where it gives us a tie for two different candidates, and you'd have to rerun the vote. And as I said, if you're recruiting a candidate, that's fine, but otherwise not. But it actually dramatically fails independence. I'm going to give an example of this in a minute. Most voting systems fail independence. This is the condition whereby whether you elect A over B should only depend on votes for A and B. It should not depend on votes for a third party C. And the border method turns out to be very vulnerable to this. It's extremely vulnerable to tactical voting. And we will see in our example at the end how that makes a huge difference to the result. So let's see why this is going to work through with an example. And here's my example. Here I'm going to have four candidates, A, B, C, and D, and five voters. So the first three voters really like candidate A and give candidate A top marks. Fantastic. But voters four and five really don't like candidate A and have given them no marks at all. Candidate B is kind of the mediocre candidate, which everyone kind of half likes. So they're putting them second, and they get two votes from every single person. It's everyone's second choice. Candidates C and candidates D are, are quite unpopular, but voter four likes C and voter five likes D. So if we add these all up, we find that A gets nine votes, B gets 10 votes, C and D six and three. So the winner of this system is B. The candidate that no one really likes has won.
Okay. Well, we all know this situation, of course. And uh, B, who has never come top with any voter, has, has won. And A, who has won the majority of the votes, has not won. So this shows that the border method has lost out on the majority condition. And also, uh, it, um, we have the fact that V4 and V5 are voting for C has basically destroyed A's chances, and that could well be an example of tactical voting. So that's the border method. And again, if you think, well, that's theoretical, they only use it in Slovenia, basically this method is used in Strictly Come Dancing. So here we have for our four judges, there they are, who have just given eight, eight, and eight, and eight to one of the dance pairs. And a, a vote which I haven't put up earlier, um, they gave nine, 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 and the fourth judge gave one to, by the way, this is a theoretical example, this is never actually occurred, to the fourth. And if we add them up, this candidate here gets 32, easily beating this candidate here, who gets 28. What do we see? Well, this candidate here, whose second choice for three of the judges has actually beaten this candidate here, who was first choice for three of the judges. So this is where Border has gone wrong. This judge here has completely swung the vote. Poor couple that fail. They have won, despite being preferred by three judges, and the fourth judge in Strictly Come Dancing has the ability to be the dictator. And this is a weakness of the Strictly Come Dancing voting method, um, compounded by the fact that you then add in the viewers' votes. So in, on Saturday, um, the pair that was voted second by the judges ended up almost last because of the viewers' votes. And it's easily possible in Strictly Come Dancing for the winner overall to be one which neither the judges like nor the viewers like. This has not gone unnoticed in the press. So there's the border method. We'll come back to the border method. But I now want to describe uh, two methods which I think all of us will be familiar with and look at their various strengths and weaknesses. So the most commonly used one, and this is what we're all going to be faced with on the 12th of December, is first past the post, FPTP. And there are various incarnations of first past the post. The uh, normal, well, the one that would be used in Parliament or was used in Brexit is you have a single issue, and with the single issue, um, or you have a, a single kind of vote with, there may be different um, candidates, and you express a single preference, and the, pre and the candidate with the most votes wins. So this is first past the post. And... You know, we're all used to it. With the Brexit vote, this is exactly what they did in Parliament. With the Brexit referendum, this is what we were asked to do. All very familiar with it. And it led me, in a rather nice way, to a correspondence on the Times. So we're going to do a bit of maths now to show you how politicians need to know maths. Um, somebody wrote to the Times saying, maths is useless, we shouldn't teach it at school, it's just to upset people. When did a politician ever need to solve simultaneous linear equations? Okay. Wow, come on. I saw this, and I, I jumped out of my seat. And so I wrote this response, which got published as political equations, um, saying um, Norman Sanders asked, how many MPs need to know how to solve simultaneous equations? And my answer was, all of them, in order to be able to vote. So to work fast the post, you need the maths of simultaneous linear equations. So now I'm going to show you, this is my most mathematical slide, um, but um, I thought it would be have some, by the way, a bit of advert there, Gresham Professor Geometry, there we are, just to prove it. Um, so let me show you how maths is important, even in the simplest of elections. So we're going to imagine we have two parties, party A with 310 members, party B with 250. I've tried to make my colours as neutral as possible, okay? <laughs> There's no attempt to politics here, okay? And we know in advance that all of Party B are going to vote against the motion. And we also know that 10 members of Party A said they'll abstain, and all the rest are going to vote one way or the other. 
So the question is, how many of party A have to vote for the motion for it to carry? OK, how many have got to vote for the motion for it to carry? It's not obvious. You've actually got to do quite a bit of mathematics to work this out. And I imagine any chief whip will need to know the answer to this question. How many politicians have they got to bully to get the answer? Well, let's take you through the maths on this. So we start with X who, of party A who vote for, Y of party A who vote against. And equation number one, we know that 10 party members of A are going to abstain. Um, X vote for, Y vote against. So there's our first equation, X plus Y plus 10 equals 310. So that's party members. Here's our second equation. Um, the number of vote who vote for must be at least, I've done this as an equality, so this is kind of the marginal case, 250, that's the party members of B, plus Y, plus 1 to, for, for kind of safety. That tells us that X will win the vote if that's the case. So these are the two simultaneous linear equations which our MPs, or the chief whips, have to solve. And if you look at it, uh, we can add these two equations together. We get 2x plus y plus 10 is 3, 560 plus y plus 1. Fortunately, y cancels from both sides. And we get 2x is 551. x is 275.5. Well, you can't have half an MP, much as we might want to. Um, and so we, we, just for safety, we go for 276. And that's the calculation you have to do. And I hope I've convinced you that the MPs do have to solve simultaneous linear equations to do this. In fact, it's more subtle than this if you've got more parties. And it just means you get more equations. So I hope I've made my point that MPs ought to know some mathematics. So there we go. Um, so there are many advantages and disadvantages of first past the post, which have been you know, described in detail by many people. It's always said that the great advantage of first past the post is it gives you a clear decision, it gives you a strong parliament, and there's no loonies getting elected by it. <laughs> well, you can think what you think. Um, I, I just say look at the evidence. Anyway, uh, so what are the disadvantages? Well, one is that we have no um, way of expressing a preference. It's purely, I like that person, I don't like the rest. And secondly, it's very easy to split the vote. And this was really brought home to me by my wonderful Bristol City Council. So I used to live in Bristol, and my children were at school. And the council decided that they would like to review the funding of schools. So we had a vote on it. And, there were, um, and you, could, you, you could tick for one of the three on the ballot paper. And one was increase secondary school funding. Good. Second was increased primary school funding. And the third was no extra funding. So this was our ballot paper. <laughs> um, what did we get? Well, that was the voting. 25% voted to increase secondary school funding. 35% voted to increase primary school funding. 40% agreed to vote for no extra funding. And the councillors looked at that and said, aha, no extra funding despite the fact that flat plus that equals 60. Okay, and I got really angry, and they actually did actually not give extra funding on the basis of this. It's crazy. Um, so this is another problem. Um, and then there's a third problem, which is particularly true of a referendum, slightly less true of Parliament, which is that there is definite possibility of error in first past the post, which is what happens if not everyone has been able to vote. So... Let's take you through Brexit. Um, this is the Brexit result, 52% for leave, 48% for remain. And that was um, the result. And the turnout rate for Brexit was 72%. And if you do the maths, that tells you that 37% of the electorate actually chose to vote leave. Okay, so that, that's the, the basic statistic. And the question is, is a 52% majority on a 72% sample 
strong enough evidence statistically to say that over the whole of the um, voting population, there's greater than 50% majority. So this is really subtle. It's a subtle question in statistics as to whether that is clear enough evidence for greater than 50% overall. So it's a subtle question in statistics. It's a matter of very hot debate, as you can imagine. And um, on a controversial level, I will say that in the statistics literature, the statistics literature says that that isn't a good enough majority, that there isn't statistical evidence enough to say that it wouldn't be 50-50 on, on another count, part of which was due to the fact that people couldn't get to the polling stations due to the weather. So I won't go into any kind of controversial politics on that, but just to say that normally when you run a referendum, it's good to build in a margin of error, like 60-40, to allow for this um, lack of everyone turning up. So that's first past the post with one constituency and voting for that. What we managed to do in the UK and the US is to turn something which is quite awkward into something a lot worse by going through multiple constituencies. So the way a multiple constituency voting works, again, we're all very familiar with this, is that we divide the country up into parliamentary constituencies. In each case, we vote for a single candidate, and then that candidate represents us, which is very, very good. I'm not going to disagree with that. Um, and the party with the most candidates is the winner. So that's the, the UK-US method. And the problem with this is it gets very, very distorted results. And this has been known for ages. So here's a good example of that. In the recent US election between uh, Trump and Clinton, uh, Trump and the Republicans got 304 electoral votes. So they got 304 members of the uh, parliament, uh, US parliament with 46.1% of the vote. The Democrats got vastly fewer, 227, but actually got 48.2% of the vote. They got many millions more votes than the Republicans. And then again, this factor here against this factor here is something we should be always bearing in mind when we have our referendums and so on. So clearly the system's gone very badly wrong there. And just to kind of give an example where we see first past the post works in exactly the opposite way to the border method, here's a made up example where we have three constituencies with parties A, B, and C. Uh, party A gets 10,000 votes in the first two, 1,000 in the third. So it wins constituency one and constituency two. So it's won two out of the three constituencies and therefore won the election. B comes second in all three constituencies and C wins in one. So we have this weird thing here where B gets comfortably the largest number of votes, but has come second in every single seat and has won no seats at all. And this is you know, a glaring problem with first past the post, which has led to a lot of kind of discussion as to whether we should be using this at all. So let's go on to uh, the usual alternative to this, which, oh, yeah, uh, I'll go on to this. Yeah, I actually will talk about gerrymandering, yes. Um, this uh, way of manipulating constituencies to make sure you get votes has been exploited a great deal. And uh, Elbridge Gerry, uh, about 200 years ago, um, approved of a very strangely shaped district in um, Massachusetts, precisely so he could get all the voters that he needed um, in, in these ones and get all the ones he didn't want in here, and uh, ended up winning the election. And gerrymandering is still practiced and illegally, and mathematicians are out there to spot whether it's happening or not. Well, let's move on. Um, proportional representation is widely used. These are the various countries in the world which use it, coloured in different colours depending on what method they use for their voting. And proportional representation is a very straightforward idea in, in principle, which is that everyone votes and you divide the number of seats you have in Parliament up proportionally to the way people have voted. Okay, so that's the basic idea of proportional representation. It has the disadvantage that, in its purest sense, that you don't get local representation for an MP, and that is a disadvantage, no doubt about it. But it is 
intuitively a fairer system in reflecting the views of the population. So that's proportional representation. It's widely used. The EU Parliament uses it. Um, but it does have problems. Problem number one is you end up with a fractional number of seats. So here's an example. Uh, you have to divide 11 seats up, and the votes from the population are in proportion half a third and a sixth. And therefore, to be purely fair, that's how many seats each party should get. Now, we've already talked about half a politician. Um, it is actually quite hard to have half politicians, even harder to have two-thirds of one. And, and so at some point, we have to make a decision on what we do about fractions. And it really matters. You know, your representation is being dependent on these kind of mathematical vagaries. So that's one problem. Um, another problem is that in this system, it's possible if you're a small party or a small country in European elections to get no seats at all um, and therefore no representation. And for the European Parliament, this is very much considered a, a bad thing. So in the Lisbon Treaty in 2009, they decided to slightly change proportional representation so that each country has to have a minimum of six seats and a maximum of 96. So that's basically breaking strict proportional representation. The word they use for it is a lovely word, degressive representation. And that, what, what that basically means is that if you're a smaller country, you get proportionally more seats because you're small than if you're a larger country. And it's actually a very fair thing. The, the countries had to kind of, the larger countries like Germany had to be kind of very um, generous to the smaller countries to allow that to happen. So that's a, a sort of bit of a fix that you need to do. And the European elections use a thing called the de Hont method for seat allocation in PR, which is a, a very mathematically based method. And this is the algorithm. Basically, you parties buy seats with the amount of votes they got, and you carry on buying seats until there are no seats left. It's not quite proportional, but it avoids the uh, fractional seat problem. Um, and here's the mathematical algorithm, the Hunt algorithm. So you count up the number of seats, a uh, number of votes, sorry, and the party with the votes, or the country with the most votes, um, gets one seat. And then you carry on running this algorithm. You take the number of votes, V, and uh, the number of seats. You add one to the number of seats and divide that into your votes. You get a number N. And then the party with the biggest value of N after this gets the next seat. And then you carry on this process until all the seats have been allocated. So this is the mathematical algorithm, the de Hunt algorithm, which is used. Um, Sorry, this is a very busy slide, but I'll just explain this. So, uh, this was used, for example, in the European elections in 2014. And if you have seven seats to allocate between four parties, and that is the uh, numbers of votes per party, A gets the first seat because they got the first number of largest number of votes. Now you add one to that. One plus one is two. You divide 100,000 by two to get 50,000. So then number N drops to 50. And so the next seat is allocated to B, which is this one. And you carry on through this process. On a computer, this is extremely quick to automate. So there's no uh, real problem with this. And the, end, the allocation in the end is this, um, with zero for D. So that would have to be fixed in the European elections. Um, and that is the de Hunt method, which slightly favors the larger parties, but broadly speaking, keeps proportionality and it is regarded as reasonably fair. Um, little story here. Uh, after this election, the European uh, Parliament, and knowing that Brexit was on its way, more or less, even then, felt that they might want to tweak this uh, system a bit to allow for countries to have a minimum number of seats and to deal with the fact that Britain was most likely about to leave. So they set up a commission chaired by the great statistician Geoffrey Grimmett from Cambridge, to look at a new voting method. And they thought very hard and came up with a voting method, which is called the Cambridge Compromise, or alternatively, the power method, which is extremely fair, extremely workable, would have worked very well. But the commission decided it was too mathematical, so they decided not to use it. Um, 
And they, they use a kind of bodge version of this, which is still pretty fair. Okay, so that's first past the post and PR. Um, and what I want to do now is talk for a little while about kind of the mathematically ideal versions of voting. So methods of voting which are arguably fairer than first past the post or proportional or the border method, they have the disadvantage that they're rather sophisticated and awkward to use and therefore would be difficult to use in a general election. But they do have the merit of being much closer um, to the axioms of voting than some of the other ones. And the great sort of um, um, idea for all of these goes back to a mathematician in the 18th century, uh, the Marques du Condorcet, and the uh, gold standard for voting is was what is generally called Condorcet methods. That's the gold standard. So Condorcet's idea was really very simple. Uh, let's again suppose that we have candidates A, B, C, whatever, and lots of voters. So we take candidate A and candidate B, and we say, how many people voted for candidate A, or how many people preferred candidate A to candidate B, as opposed to how many people preferred candidate B to candidate A? And if more people prefer candidate A to candidate B than preferred candidate B to candidate A, they become the winner of that particular contest. Okay, so there we are. So that would be A winning B. And if there's one candidate that wins all of these sort of pairwise contests, they are declared the winner, and they have a title there called the Condorcet winner. And this is a very, very fair thing. It's taking everyone's views into account and um, judging them very carefully. Now, the Condorcet winner doesn't satisfy all of Arrow's actions. We know they don't, um, but it does satisfy uh, the first three. So, Condorcet dinners don't always exist, but if one does exist, we'd like our voting method to somehow find them. So let's see how we do. Well, here's an example. Uh, again, this is slightly busy, but I'll try and explain. Um, here's a, an election, and in this election, 10 voters expressed that as their preference. They said A was better than B was better than C. One voter said that A was better than C, better than B, dot, 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 down to five voters said that B was better than A, was better than C. So let's have a look at this. If we um, compare A against B, we see that A is better than B for these ten voters and for that one voter and for these five. So there are 16 voters that think A is better than B. There are 14 voters that say B is better than A. So overall, there are two more voters that think A is better than B than say B is better than A. And I express that as saying, here's A that beats B by two votes. If you do the same calculation, you find A beats C by two votes, B beats C by 18 votes, but A comes out top, and they are the Condorcet winner. Separate calculation, which you can do at home, uh, is if you rank in this sort of way, you find that B is the border winner. I say border is very good at getting a compromised candidate that no one actually likes. Okay. Um, and A is the Condorcet winner, so A has won. Um, doesn't always work. Scissors, paper, stone. Um, scissors uh, cuts paper, uh, so it beats paper. Paper beats stone, stone beats scissor, no one wins. So there's no Condorcet winner in this case, and that's just just life, okay. And um, we call this a cyclic situation. But normally things are a bit more subtle. Here's a very kind of subtle election where um, three cases A has beaten B um, um, and so on. And here's my diagram. In this case, A beats B by one, A beats C by one, but D beats A by one. And there's no one candidate that beats all the other candidates. There's no clear winner in this case. So who has won? Well, A has won three times, and therefore, for first past the post, A would win. And again, if you do a border calculation, you find that B wins. So already we have a disagreement. 
There's no Condorcet winner. But one of the axioms, the chief axioms of Arrow was that a voting system has to give an answer. You don't want to have a general election. At the end of the day, the voting people say, well, we looked at the votes, but couldn't decide, so who cares? You know. Uh, so we have to find out who has won. So what has happened since Condorcet is that various people have looked at who might actually win in this sort of circumstance. So uh, Copeland's method, which is more or less used in Premier League, which is to say that if you have a candidate which wins the majority of these pairwise contests, then that candidate should win. That's Copeland's method. Um, the disadvantage is here. So A wins two of the contests but loses to B, to D. B wins two of the contests but loses to A. So A and B actually tie for first place. And this to happen, seems to happen most of the time with Copeland's method, so it's never used. So that's not so good. But there are two other methods which are kind of better. Um, Schultz's method. Now, you may not have heard of Schultz's method, but you probably will use Schultz's method. Because if you have access to a large amount of computational machinery and you have a lot of voters, then this is a very, very fair way of voting. You can never use it for a general election. It would be much too complicated. But if you're prepared to do electronic voting, it's great. Where do we do electronic voting? when you do thumbs up for things on Wikipedia on YouTube, or where you rank things in Amazon, or when you go onto Wikipedia and you rank things. So on the internet, when there's voting, the chances are it will be done using Schultz's method. So it's actually an extremely popular, very fair, and good method. It's not used for uh, elections, mainly because it's too complicated and requires electronic technology. If we get to a point where we can trust electronic technology to be safe and secure, we may start using this for elections. Um, it's mathematically quite tricky. I'll, I'll very quickly whiz through it, but if you want to read more, I've written a lot in the transcript about this. Um, what you do is you take the same information that we had before, and you draw this same sort of network, um, but if A beats B, you say how many uh, matches A beat B by, which is four. So you create this sort of table here, and then you create what we call paths. So a path is a route through this table um, from one candidate to another. So if I want to get from A to C, I can either beat A, C this way or this way, and the strength of the path is the smallest number on it. Broadly speaking, it's the most the, the, the least number of people that you have to beat in order to beat that candidate. That's called the strength of the path. Um, so you construct paths from candidate A to Y, and the strength of the path is the value of the weakest link. So these are the strengths here. And then the short selection winner is the one whose path is stronger than any other path. So um, if I want to beat B, if X wants to beat Y, they need to overcome a smaller barrier than for Y to be X. So it looks really complicated. Mathematically, it can be implemented quickly on a computer because we can do these calculations quickly. Um, it obeys the greater majority of the axioms that you'd want for any voting system, apart from the um, irrelevant candidate one. It obeys monetarily all of these. Um, it's, it's really a fair system, and I say widely used on the internet. And the winner in this election was B, according to that method, which also happens to be the border winner. But unlike border, this satisfies the majority condition and many, many other things besides. So watch out. We may be seeing short selections in the future when we get onto more sophisticated technology. But one of my favorite voting methods um, was invented... Um, I suppose about 150 years ago, by someone who will be very familiar, probably to everyone on the audience, and particularly anyone that went to Robin Wilson's talk last month, um, which is the Dodgson method. Charles Dodgson, otherwise known as Lewis Carroll. So um, Charles Dodgson was a mathematician at Christchurch College. There's Christchurch College. 
And Christ Church College has a belfry, and they had a really acrimonious debate amongst the fellows, you know, the sort of horrible backbiting, you know, cat fights that you only get amongst fellows of Oxford Colleges, um, <laughs> about the design of the new belfry. Okay. And Dodgson lost the, the vote. And being a proper mathematician, he realized that the reason he lost it wasn't because his views were wrong, but because the voting system was wrong. So I don't know quite what the voting system was, but um, Dodgson then went and wrote a, a series of really important papers about voting and came up with the Dodgson idea. So I quite like the Dodgson idea. It's very intuitive. And it's basically this. It's say we run the election, and if there's no clear Condorcet winner, then you kind of ask people to change their minds. Again, when we're electing, uh, when we're recruiting at Bath, we give people the chance to change their minds. And the winner of the election is the one for whom fewer people have to change their minds than anyone else. So it's very reasonable. Um, you, know, you know, you do a vote in Parliament, something, something happens, you then say, well, did you really mean that? And they think, well, maybe I would have voted the other way. And the smallest number that needs to be done is the Dodgson winner. OK, and for our example here, I won't go through the details, but it turns out that B, and this is the example we had earlier, is the candidate for whom the smallest number of mind changes have to be made to vote, to win, and they are the Dodgson winner. So that's the Dodgson method. It has advantages and disadvantages. The advantages of the, dis the Dodgson method is that it's very fair, it satisfies a vast number of the axioms that you want for voting. The main disadvantage is that it's far too complicated to use in practice. It's what we call an NP-hard problem. So if you had an election with, say, 10,000 people, it would probably take about a year to get to the answer, whereas the Schultz method will give it pretty quickly, and first past the points gives you instantly. So here's a good example, classic mathematical thing, perfect in theory, useless in practice. Okay. It's like in my job when I forecast the weather, if my algorithms take more than a day to forecast tomorrow's weather, they're not that impressed with them. <laughs> okay. okay, so we've seen the mathematically ideal type of voting. Okay. And as I say, the Schultz method is a lot to recommend it. But the problem with these mathematical ones is that if the voting really, really matters and people want to be absolutely certain that the whole process is very transparent and clear, these are not particularly good methods because it's hard to see what's going on and how the computer's making the decision. So what we tend to use are approximations to the truth and um, the kind of practical compromises that are used in most countries apart from the UK uh, are things like um, instant runoff voting or alternative voting um, or single transferable votes. And the idea of these is that when you have an election for, let's say, a candidate, rather than voting just for one candidate, you're allowed to express a preference. So here's a con an Australian voting form uh, where we have on top marriage equality, animal justice, um, Nick Xenophon team, that's an interesting one, uh, Greens, Liberal Democrats, and so on, and you can express a preference for who you want. And essentially the same is used in STV, except that's done for when you've got um, um, several candidates rather than one. So this is how, if you live in Australia, you will end up um, electing your prime minister or, or whatever. So you express a preference, so we've, it's an improvement over first past the post, um, and you count up, and if one candidate has more than half first choice people voting for them, then they win. Okay. Um, if not, you take the candidate with the fewest number of points, votes, and you eliminate them. Well, eliminate them from the competition. <laughs> Um, and then you take those, the, the votes that, that that candidate would have got from everyone else and you redistribute them according to the preferences. And then you do another vote and you successfully eliminate candidates, redistributing until you've got one left and they are the winner. So let's see how that works. Um, again, here are my candidates A, B, C. 
Here my vote is A, B, C, D, E. And um, one here means first choice. It's, this isn't a board vote. This is the first choice. Um, so candidate A gets first choice from A and D. So they get two first choices overall. B gets first choice from B and E. They get two overall. C only gets one first choice. So they are eliminated. Um, just for a point of fact, this is a purely cyclic case. Um, uh, B gets, m m does better than A, A does better than C, and C actually does better than B overall. So there's no Condorcet winner in this case. So we've actually got to work a bit. So we eliminate C. Um, we then have a second round. So if we look at uh, here, C was candidates A's, uh, voter A's second choice. They're eliminated. So B becomes candidate uh, voter A's second choice. Um, that doesn't change. Um, and in this case, B becomes candidate C's, uh, voter C's first choice. So that is now the redistribution. And, and if you do it, you find that A is now first choice of two. B is first choice of three. So B wins the IRA, R -I -R -V vote. Okay. Interestingly enough, I ran this same thing through my border voting algorithm and my Schultz voting algorithm, both of which told me that A was the winner. As I say, voting methods, there's no one good method. There's always going to have fours. So that's IRV. Uh, a few years ago, there was a vote in the UK as to whether we should use IRV, or as we called it, AV, as our voting method. And of course, it was voted out. So we have, as a British electorate, decided not to use this method, which I think is a shame. Um, STV, which goes back to 1819, is essentially the same, but applies instead of voting for one candidate, you might have several candidates. So you, instead of one constituency, you lump several constituencies together. So you still get representation, but on a kind of broader thing. Um, and it does exactly the same as IRV except you continue until n candidates are left, and that is the winner. It's used for the elections of that august body, the London Mathematical Society. Uh, it's used in the Republic of Ireland and many, many other places. Um, it's easy to use. It's approximately proportional. It's reasonably fair, but it doesn't necessarily, as we've seen, deliver the Condorcet winner, so it's not necessarily mathematically the best. As I say, all voting methods are a compromise. So that's all the theory. That's all the theory of voting. So I hope you've absorbed that, because now we're going to do the practice, the Eurovision Song Contest. OK, so here we have voting uh, for the Eurovision Song Contest. And this is the Lithuanian entry. Uh, this was a few years ago. United Kingdom, 23 votes as opposed to Denmark, 281. This is normally where we are, except we're more possibly down there. OK, a uh, few Eurovision facts. Um, so it's been running since the 1950s. Uh, nowadays, there are 26 entrants in the final, um, mainly known for the staging, the costumes, the announcers, and the sarcastic commentators. Very, very occasionally, it has a good song. And here is one of them, ABBA, winning in 1974. My favorite Eurovision of all time was 1994 in Ireland, where everyone agreed that the, the overall winner of the entire competition was the interval music, <laughs> uh, which was um, uh, river dance, by the way. Um, and we always have a competition in my family as to who's going to win. Um, but you get a special prize if your country gets no points at all. And this was first won in 1978 by Norway, um, but I'm pleased to say the UK has also achieved no points overall. Um, one of the defining moments in my childhood occurred in 1968. 1968 is known for many things, uh, the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Soviet Union, the, the riots in France by the students, but most important of all, it was the year when Cliff Richard uh, sang the song Congratulations and was winning right up to the last moment where he was pipped at the post by the immortal song La La La. Here we are, by one point. This was a really 
you know, got me there. I was supporting Cliff all the way. Um, and ever since then, there have been widespread accusations of vote rigging. Um, I, for copyright reasons, I am afraid I'm, I'm not allowed to, to play you either song here. Um, but those of you who are around in 1968 might like to hum it to yourselves. OK, so that's the, the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, much more importantly, how does the voting work? Well, I think the voting at the end is much more fun than the songs. Normally, I don't even bother to watch the songs, or if I do watch, I turn off the sound. Um, and it's a really good contrast between fair voting for the song and tactical and political voting, which we'll just talk about in a second. Basically, it uses what we call a double border method. So um, the jurists for each country rank each song apart from their own countries, and they, they uh, allow, give them border votes uh, going from 12 down to the famous null point over here. Um, similarly, each country will um, have a televote. They will rank them and give them a border vote, giving exactly the same thing. Um, and then you simply add the votes together. So that's the Eurovision method. Um, these votes accumulate to build up the tension. The tele votes are added at the end. Um, and here's a, an example taken from a couple of years ago where Sweden came top of the jury score. That's their jury score. They were ranked first. The tele vote score came, th they were ranked third. You add these two together, total score. And that's the total rank. And that's the Eurovision um, vote for that year. So, what do we know? Well, this is a border method. It has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, big advantage, it's real time. You build up the vote and you get tension building up as the results are announced. Uh, this is Jedward, by the way, from Ireland, saying they really like this method. Um, this was the cringeworthy UK entry one year, um, which, um, um, well, the disadvantage is it's not a Condorcet method, so we can easily get a winner that no one particularly likes. Um, certainly doesn't necessarily elect the song that the majority favour. But best of all, like all true border methods, it's extremely vulnerable to tactical voting. And um, I'm going to show you now a graphic which explains the tactical voting methods used in the Eurovision Song Contest. I won't try and describe it. I would simply like you to watch it. I was going to play Congratulations um, whilst this happened for copyright reasons, I can't do that. So you can hum it to yourselves while you look at the complexities <laughs> of tactical voting in the Eurovision Song Contest. You'll notice that the UK is not doing very well over here. We only really like the Irish, um, the uh, Yugoslavians. Um, by the way, although this is fun, there's substantial statistical analysis that this is actually the case. Though the whole thing is done tactically, there's no real merit to the songs at all. Um, the, well, there are merits to the song. There's the, the merit of the song plays very little re relationship to whether you vote or not. So um, you can uh, have a look at that in detail on the transcript if you wish. Um, but I will simply finish by saying good luck to everyone on December the 12th. Thank you very much. <laughs>